In this video, I'm going to help you with it, guys with a homework problem. This is one a couple of people have asked about. Um, it said, two planes cut a right cylinder, excuse me, right circular cylinder to form a wedge. One plane is perpendicular to the cylinder. So basically what that first plane is doing is it's taking our cylinder and it's cutting it in half. So we've got a cylinder that looks like this. The first plane says, let's take half of this. Maybe I didn't do a very good job cutting it in half, but you get the idea. So we're going to cut it in half. And then the second plane makes an angle with the first. So one plane is cutting it in half, and then the second plane intersects like this. Um, I've tried to draw the second plane in blue, um, and the angle for part A is 45 degrees. So this is going to cut this into two pieces. Um, a lot of people thought that the volume of this piece would just be one-fourth the volume of the cylinder, but that's not the case. We are taking half the volume of the cylinder, um, so it's like this volume over here, and then we're splitting it into two pieces. But notice that if we cut, there's, there's this piece and there's this other piece that we're taking away. This other piece actually has a flat edge. It has an edge, oops, goes to the top like this. Got some white out there because I didn't do a very good job with my picture the first time I graphed it. But it has like a square side. It's that, um, that side that's going to be in the middle of our cylinder. And this wedge is completely rounded. It's on the outside of the cylinder. So this volume is not the same as this volume. We're asked in this question to find the volume of the wedge if the angle is 45 degrees. Now, this section is about solids with known cross sections. Obviously, if we slice um, either parallel to the bottom um, or uh, perpendicular uh, to the bottom, uh, well, perpendicular to the y-axis or perpendicular to the x-axis, all of those slices are going to be different. But notice, if this is my y-axis, and they gave me that in the picture, that if I slice this way, so slice perpendicular to the y-axis, all of those slices sitting on top of this semicircular semi region down here, all those slices are going to be triangles. Um, so this is actually a volume of a solid with known cross-section whose cross-sections are triangles. Now if I slice it this way, I'm going to see parts of a circle. The bottom I'm going to see a semicircle, and then I'm going to see one, so it'll look like this. And then I slice a little bit up, and I'm just going to see this part of the circle, and then this part of the circle. But the areas of these parts of a circle are very difficult to find. Um, so even though we could slice it this way, um, finding those volumes is difficult, so we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to slice perpendicular to the y-axis, and imagine that we've got um, triangles sitting on top of this thing. So. So let's look at it. Um, our picture looks like this. They told us the y-axis is like this, and this is the positive x-axis. This is the positive x-axis. This must be the negative x-axis. So I know it's a little bit turned around, but this is what it looks like. We've got y positive here, x positive here, and this circle doesn't exist where x is positive. It only exists over here where x is negative, according to the picture that they gave us. Um, x is negative, x is positive on this side, and it's negative on this side. So we've got a semicircular base. And what else are we told? Um, I didn't write it down here, but we're told that the cylinder has a radius of r. So this is y is going from negative r to r, and x is going from negative r to 0 and cross sections perpendicular to the y-axis. So if we slice this way, on top of that little piece, we're going to see a right triangle. So if I look at that, I'm going to have a triangle that looks like this. Make it a little bigger so it's easier for me to see. Now for part A, that's 45, 45, 90. And this flat edge is on that edge of our cylinder. So it's going up, there's like a little triangle coming up, and then over here. 
Like you have to imagine it coming out of the page and it looks like this. Roughly. So the volume of this wedge can be found by finding a bunch of volumes of pieces that look like this. They told us this angle um, that the wedge was making is 45 degrees. So we've got that hard edge, that straight up and down edge over here, and a 45 degree angle on this side. And the length of the base right here, well, that base is sitting on top of this rectangle. It's the same as the length of the rectangle. Um, so with that, those two pieces of information, we're going to be able to figure this out. Okay, so let me start over a little bit. Let's go through all the steps. Um, first, we had to recognize this was a solid with known cross sections. And then we have to slice the solid so that all of the, the slices have the same shape. And this is difficult. I think sometimes our intuition misleads us on this. But if I slice perpendicular to the y-axis, all of those are going to be triangles, and they're going to be triangles that look like this. Um, if I slice perpendicular to the x-axis, um, yeah, there, it's just going to be some weird rectangles of strange heights. I don't think that's going to help us. Um, and if we slice perpendicular to the bottom, we're going to end up with these parts of a circular sector, or parts of a circle, and if it, after the semicircle, those formulas get more and more complicated. So we're not going to do that. This is the easiest geometry to find the volume of. So we're going to slice perpendicular to the y-axis and imagine we've got a bunch of 45, 45, 90 triangles, those slices sitting on top of that rectangle. So we sliced so that they all have the same shape. Um, in this case we have slices perpendicular to the y-axis there 45 45 90 triangles um, so we're going to put those two pieces of information together to state the volume of our um, slice so we want the volume of the ith slice. That's actually not too bad. Volume is easy. It's just area times the thickness of that slice. And the thickness is the same as the width of the representative rectangle. So that's delta y. And area of a triangle is just 1 half base times height. Now for this particular triangle with theta equals 45 degrees, the base and the height are the same because the side that's opposite the 45 on this side, it has to be equal to the side length opposite the 45 on that side. So this is 1 half base times height times delta y, but base and height are the same for our 45, 45, 90. So it's really just 1 half of the base squared times delta y. Okay, so now we've got our formula. All we need is the base in terms of y. And that's easy. I just go over to my picture and I look at the length of that triangle, because, or excuse me, the length of that rectangle. The length of that rectangle is the same as the length of the base over here. That's pretty much how you do all of your solids with known cross sections. You compare this length of the tri or le length of the representative rectangle to the dimensions of your slice. So our base, um, our base and the length of that rectangle are exactly the same. So the base is horizontal, so it's x on the right minus x on the left. But I need them in terms of y because of that, that width, delta y. x on the right is just 0. Be careful, x on the left is not negative r x on the left is negative r when y equals 0, but it changes. 
x on the left is this distance here, and then it's that distance there. And as y goes from r to 0, the x on the left just keeps growing. And then when it, y goes from 0 to negative r, the x on the left um, starts shrinking. Um, so we need this x on the left to be a function of y, and it has to change. Um, well, that's easy enough to do. We just need to find the equation of this curve and solve it for x in terms of y. Well, that's a circle, a semicircle. On that circle, x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. Now, if I want x on the left as a function of y, first I subtract the y squared from both sides and then take the square root. But careful, we are on the part of the um, base over here where x is negative. See, here's the positive x-axis, that's the negative x-axis. Or in this picture, here's the positive x-axis, and here's the negative x-axis. Um, so when I solve this for x, I need to make sure to take the negative square root. Because you always do plus or minus this square root. But we don't want the positive x value, because that would land us over here. We want the negative one, because that means we're on this side. So that's x on the left is a function of y. So you sub that in. So it's negative square root of r squared minus y squared. Make sure you put a y sub i there. And a negative, or minus, subtracting a negative is the same as adding. So the base is the square root of r squared minus y sub i squared and that's what I'm going to fill in right here. And then when I square that, that gets rid of the square root. And that's the, that's the volume of one slice. So the total volume, this is for part A, is the limit as the number of slices goes to infinity of the sum as i goes from 1 to n of the volume of each of those slices, and that's equal to 1 half times r squared minus y squared, delta y becomes dy, and we're integrating from one y value to another. We look at our picture, y goes from negative r to r. So I'll bring my 1 half down, antiderivative of r squared with respect to y is r squared times y, bring the negative 1 down, then we add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. Substitute in y equals negative r and y equals r and subtract. So you've got 1 half, r squared times another r is r cubed, minus 1 third r cubed. And then we're subtracting 1 half times r squared times a negative r is negative r cubed. And we have minus 1 third negative r cubed. Okay, so this is 1r minus, or 1r cubed minus a third of them. So it's going to be 2 thirds of r cubed. And you have minus 1 half over here. That's going to be a negative r cubed. A negative times a negative is positive. So I'm going to have negative r cubed plus 1 third of positive r cubed. So it's going to be negative 2 thirds r cubed. So that's one third of r cubed minus a minus is a plus, plus another one third of r cubed. So we get two thirds of r cubed. That's a lot of work. So that's the volume, that's part A, if the angle is 45 degrees. Now let's see, where did that 45 degrees show up in the problem? That 45 degree angle here turned into that 45 degree angle here. I've got a triangle that height is going straight up. It's that side of my cylinder. Um, but the angle right here comes from that angle that we're slicing, um, or that, that angle from the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the plane that's slicing our cylinder. Okay, so we did part A, cool. Now let's look at part B. We're going to do exactly the same thing, but for an arbitrary angle theta. So this is still our base, and our triangles are still going to look like this, but instead of a 45 degree angle there, we're just going to have a theta there. 
So this is going to feel very familiar because we're doing the same thing, just an abstract. I know this whole problem is a little abstract. But we're going to be even more abstract. I'm sorry, that doesn't look like a semicircle. It's okay though. When in doubt, just label it semicircle and say not to scale. That's what I do. Okay, we're still slicing this way. And we still have a triangle sitting on top. And that's theta. And this one has to be 90 minus theta. So that 90 minus theta plus theta gives us 90. And we still have a right triangle. This hard edge um, is on the side, that circular side of our cylinder. It's that edge that's going straight up and down. That's what we're going to see right here. Okay. And this base. is the length of this rectangle over here because this is that triangle is sitting directly on top of this like you have to imagine that triangle coming out of the page um, and the width of our little triangular slice is the same as the width of that rectangle so that's delta y and that's delta y okay so now we're going to put all the pieces together i need the volume of one slice volume is going to be area times the thickness of the slice, which is delta y. And for a triangle, you have one half base times height. And we've already calculated the base. We said earlier x squared plus y squared was r squared. And actually, let's do it all down here. The base was x on the right minus x on the left, x on the right is 0, x on the left came from solving this for x, um, and because x was negative in our semicircle, we had to take the negative square root, oops, that's y squared, you should check that out, we did that earlier, and so the base is still the square root of r squared minus y sub i squared, that has not changed. Um, but the height relative to the base has changed. When that angle was 45 degrees, the height and the, the base were the same. Um, but now, our height and base have a different relationship. So we're going to have to use a little trig. Here is the height of my triangle, h sub i. Well, according to trigonometry, the tangent of theta, remember so Katoa? Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So we're going to have opposite over adjacent here. Um, so that is, the opposite side is the, the height, and the adjacent side is the base. So the height turns out to be, if I solve that for this, the base times tan theta. All right. So now I can substitute that in over here. And I don't know why I switched from lowercase to uppercase. I just sort of did. So you have 1 half base times height times delta y. And according to this, the height is the base times tan theta. So we have 1 half of the base squared times tan theta. And the base is still that square root of r squared minus y squared. And we're squaring it. Take a, a square root and you square it, you just get the original expression back. So you've got r squared minus y sub i squared times tan theta times delta y. That's the volume of one slice. All right, that's enough. That's enough to get us our volume integral. The volume is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum 
as I goes from one to n of all of those volume pieces, and that's gonna be equal to this integral. We're gonna have one half of r squared minus y squared times tan theta dy. We're gonna integrate from, look at our region, y goes from negative r to r. Let's look at this integral and look how it compares to the one with a 45 degree angle. With the 45 degree angle, we didn't have a tan theta here, but everything else looked exactly the same. We're integrating from negative r to r. We've got 1 half base squared. So the only difference is that we've added this tan theta. Now you can go through the integration again if you want to, but I think I just want to factor out the tan theta. Let's save ourselves some time. Let's be efficient. We know this from part A is uh, two-thirds of r cubed. So when you multiply those together, you get two-thirds of r cubed times tan theta. That's nice. That's part B. Okay. So now the question says, Last part, assuming the cylinder has sufficient length, how does the volume change as theta increases from zero to 90 degrees? Hmm. Well, let's think about this. What does tangent of theta look like? A tangent of theta has this graph. Tangent is undefined whenever cosine is zero, because remember, tangent is sine over cosine. And cosine is zero at all of the odd multiples of pi over two. So at negative pi over two, we get zero. At pi over two, we get zero. Three pi over two, we get zero, and so on. And tangent turns out to look like this. Now pi over two radians is the same as 90 degrees. So, the volume when theta equals zero, that's two-thirds of r cubed times tangent of zero, which is zero. Not much volume there. Let's actually think about what's physically happening. If this plane were at theta equals zero, it wouldn't be intersecting our cylinder at all. The first plane cut the cylinder in half, and the second plane would just separate, if theta equals zero, it would separate the bottom of the cylinder from the rest of it. So there would be no volume in the wedge at all. So that makes sense that when theta equals zero, we get no volume. But then as theta increases, so as theta approaches 90 degrees, and we're approaching from the right, Notice what happens to tangent. Again, 90 degrees and pi over two radians are the same thing. Um, tangent of theta goes to infinity. And if tangent of theta goes to infinity, that means that our volume, which is two thirds of r cubed times tangent of theta, that has to go to infinity as well. Okay, now let's think about what, what we mean by that. Say, how on earth does that go to infinity? This is 45 degrees. If it was 60 degrees, it would slice a little higher. Now you might say our cylinder doesn't go that high, but they say, assuming the cylinder has sufficient length, you'd say, well, just make your cylinder a little longer until the, that plane actually intersects it. So if my theta was 60 degrees, I would just have to make this longer and taller, and then the volume is gonna be larger. And if theta was equal to 80 degrees, I'd have to make it really long and tall um, so that we got that wedge shape. Now, as theta approaches 90 degrees, we're not gonna have a wedge. Um, when theta equals 90 degrees, if our cylinder is infinitely long and infinitely tall, um, we're not gonna see any wedge here. We're gonna have a volume that's also going to infinity. Because you're basically taking the volume of half of a cylinder that goes on forever in the z direction, z direction being up from this. Um, so I think it makes sense that our volume would approach infinity 
as theta approaches 90 degrees. Now, if there's any part of that that didn't make sense, please reach out. Please let me know if you have questions. Um, I would be happy to help you. This stuff is hard, um, honestly. It's hard to visualize, and sometimes our intuition is incorrect. Um, if you have any questions about what I said, if there's anything that I said that sounded incorrect, feel free to correct me, or f feel free to just have a conversation with me about what you're thinking when I'm, and what I'm thinking, um, because I would love to, to be able to help you get on the right path and help you to really understand what it is you're doing on problems like this. Um, so that was unit two, lesson two, homework, problem number 13.